I'm Liam Billingham. I'm George Fragopoulos. I'm Randy Wilkins. <gasps> He's back, you guys. He's back. And this is... Who's saying it? Somebody say it. Uber oh. Busters. Yeah! Yes! yes. <laughs> you know? It's a true... I nailed it's it. A true, it's a true sign that you are a friend <laughs> and family. To reference a joke that nobody else heard, France is really the Staten Island of Europe when it comes to language. <laughs> I'm going to have a whole bunch of French people after me for saying that. Uh, Randy, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. It's uh, great so, to be back. Totally. It's awesome. And uh, I was when we decided to talk about the movie that we were going to talk about, I was like, I got, we got to get Randy for this one. So it's going to be really, really fun. Let me do a quick, for those of you who have not heard our superlative, superlative, superb Joker episode, I'll introduce Randy. Randy Wilkins is a three-time Emmy award-winning writer, director, and editor from the Bronx, New York. As a director, Randy helmed the ESPN 30 for 30 Lil Spike joint 8632, chronicling the controversial decision between Roy jo Jones Jr. and Park Si Hun in the light middle heavyweight gold medal match at the 1988 Summer Olympics. In addition, Randy's directed the series premiere of Deer, featuring Spike Lee for Apple Plus. Wilkins' latest efforts are directing the Jackie Robinson spot for Major League Baseball and helming, helming the Pepsi Holiday Give Back commercial. Outside of directing, Randy has served as lead editor on numerous Spike Lee joints, including She's Gotta Have It and Rodney King for Netflix. He is currently on development for his feature script, Pray for a Little More Spring, while also in co-development for the miniseries Forward Ever. Randy, it seems like you have not a lot going on, so I do appreciate <laughs> that you took some time <laughs> to come talk about Akira Kurosawa with us. Um, this is great. We very rarely have filmmakers on the show, so I'm excited to talk about the movie that we're going to talk about. George, do you want to tell us what movie we're going to talk about? Yes, I would love to. So we're talking about 1958's The Hidden Fortress. So for those of you who have never seen The Hidden Fortress, also, I guess the Japanese title translates to as Three Bad Men in a Hidden Fortress. Is that what you wrote? Three there? Bad Men in a Hidden Fortress is the Japanese title. Normally, I try to do the Japanese titles, um, which is the Japanese title is Kakushi Toridi no San Akunin, which translates to literally the three villains of the Hidden Fortress. Wow. What a good, what a more complicated title than the movie than the title the hidden fortress suggests well, i was gonna say because i thought there were only like two villains but anyway we could talk debatable. about that, of mm, debatable debatable mm, layers um so the hidden fortress tells the story of two peasants tahi and marashichi who become involved in a conflict between the Ak akizuki clan and the yamana clan um, as they try to survive the aftermath of a battle that they were too late to join because they're kind of bubbling idiots bubbling um Bubbling? Bubbling? <laughs> Bumbling? They're bubbling idiots. <laughs> They're bubbling idiots. Bumbling idiots? <laughs> the guy who, who says that might also himself be a bumbling idiot. No um, comment. As they try to survive the aftermath of a battle that they were too late to join, the two peasants discover some hidden gold near the titular hidden fortress. They also are discovered by Tashira Mifune's character, uh, Makabe Rokurota? Rokurota. Roku yeah, Rokurota. Yeah. Rota. Yeah, it's a tough one. Who is the general of the defeated, um, or a general de of the defeated clan. Um, he is hiding, he is in hiding with the princess Yuki, who's the the heir of the now nearly destroyed um, Akuzuki clan. Um, Rokurota sees the peasants as a kind of Trojan horse to you that he can use to get them across the border into Hakakawa. Um, whose lord is an ally. The four of them then begin this adventure in which they try and cross the border into friendly territory. And in the meantime, they find themselves getting into a series of adventures like a fire festival, um, saving a woman from who's been sold into sexual bondage, and a number of battles and last-minute escapes. Heroes eventually survive all these adventures, and the princess is restored to the throne. The end. There we go. Boom. Uh, the film was written, it was directed by Akira Kurosawa. It was produced by Sanzuzumi Fujimoto and Akira Kurosawa. The screenplay was written by Ryozo Kikushima, Hideo Agune, Shinobu Hashimoto, and, and Akira Kurosawa. Um, cinematography, which is unbelievable in this movie, mm -hmm. and I really want to talk about it, is Kazu Yamazaki, and it was edited by Akira Kurosawa. And this is interesting to me, for two, two reasons. I just want to throw this in now. So the film's shot in August 
of 1958. And it was supposed to be finished in August, but the set was destroyed three times by tsunamis. So they kept having to move locations. They wrapped the film on December 11th, finished it December 23rd, and it was released December 28th. (laughs) Crazy. Unbelievable. It's like a Soderbergh. (laughs) Fucking, (laughs) especially when you consider the score of this movie. Um, And uh, the production company was Toho. And just a fun little detail is that every morning during the writing phase of the movie, Kurosawa would, who is known for like inviting his writers to spas for months to write scripts, which sounds amazing. um, He would invent insane situations and the other writers would think of ways to get the protagonists out of it. And that's how they built the script for the movie, which is incredible. Um, I'm going to do a very, very quick um, cast list here. Toshiro Mifune as General Roku Rota Makabe, um, Minori Chiaki as Tahe, Kamatari Fujiwari as Matashishi, um, Susumu Fujita as General Hio Tadakoro, Takashi Shimura as General Izumi Nagakura, Misa Uhara as Princess Yuki, Iko Miyoshi as Yuki's lady, lady in waiting, and just really quick, Koji Mitsui as the pit guard. I emphasize those names because these are folks that have been in almost all of the movies that we have talked about so far on the season, just to emphasize Akira Kurosawa's uh, penchant for being loyal to actors and bringing them back in all of his films. Um, the movie uh, was designed as an entertainment. Kurosawa was like, I just made Throne of Blood. I just made Lower Depths. I want to make something that's like pure, pure entertainment, which is really interesting. Film was shot in Cinemascope, which was a new form of widescreen that um, had only been recently brought to Japan. Um, and Kurosawa, I really want to talk about this, clearly took advantage of the format to make this movie. Um, the, the, the film was cut in 1962 to 90 minutes and wasn't seen in its full restored form until 1984, which I would be curious to see what a 90 minute version of this movie looks like. I don't think it would be great. And I think the thing, the thing that sort of inspired, uh, wanting to talk to Randy about this movie is that this movie was hugely influential on a little independent film called (laughs) star Wars. (laughs) So, Randy, what I'd like before we jump into the movie, I'd love to hear your relationship to Kurosawa's work and if it's if it's sort of found its way into the way you think about filmmaking. Uh, I am like almost everybody else a huge fan of Kurosawa. I can't say that I've seen every single one of his films, um, but I've seen a great deal. Um, this is actually my first time seeing Hidden Fortress, even though I I knew the history of the film. Um, so it was like a great experience for me to, to watch it for the first time. Um, the biggest thing for me when it comes to Kurosawa as a director is just, um, his use of movement and motion in the frames. So he's the first director where I've really understood the different options that a director had in terms of, of movement. So you Mm -hmm. can move the camera, you can use weather as movement, you can use, characters walking across the frame as movement there's like eight or nine ways that kurosawa used movement to make sure that the frames were interesting and engaging and and never static and one of the things this is like super like film nerdy talk but yeah do it randy do it (laughs) one thing that i really noticed watching the film was the use of water which is something that pops Mm -hmm. up in kurosawa's films a lot so it was either raining or they were at um a river or they were um, at some like creek or whatever um, water pops up a lot in a lot of different formats and it's mm-hmm. and it's an easy way for you to create movement within the frame so that was something that popped up to me and just the blocking also of a lot of mm-hmm. the characters and the 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 scale of using extras was really um, mm-hmm. something that stood out to me as well. There were so many extras in, in some of these scenes that it really caught me off guard. It was like super epic um, mm-hmm. in, in a way that I didn't expect it to be. Um, so yeah, as, as a filmmaker, Kurosawa is probably the one person that I always will go back to when I'm trying to think of ways to incorporate movement in different ways and just just the that go beyond just the conventional usage of movement in cinema. Yeah, I feel like I'd sort of put this in my notes. I I wonder if this makes sense to you guys. I would view the filmmaking in this movie as almost athletic. 
Like it's like he just knows from like that first shot in the movie where he's following the two peasants. Yeah. You're like, because of the time that this film was made, you're like, holy shit, this this feels like the first time anybody did this sort of large format camera on the shoulder follow these guys and let this thing play out in this incredible two shot with the wide focal depth, focal length so that you can sort of see everything interacting in the frame. I think that the opening shot of this movie is my favorite shot from any Kurosawa film because you're just favorite opening in shot? It. favorite, op- favorite shot maybe of any shot maybe. of a Kurosawa movie because it, it, it to me, we can talk a little bit more about it, but it, it immediately establishes the kind of movie we're watching, yes. which is pretty incredible to do in, three seconds to be like, I know what this movie is. And I'm like 100% here for it. Yeah. And it's funny that you mentioned that because for, for a couple of reasons, one, this goes completely against the convention that I was taught immediately at, in film school. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I went to Tisch school of arts, blah, 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 blah. And, um, <laughs> four my, years later. Yeah. Five years. Uh, right. my first year, small little school called NYU. Yeah. Small school. Nobody, nobody's heard of it, but the, it's the uh, Star Wars of colleges. Yes, well, that would be USC. We don't want to talk that's about. True. We don't want to talk about those yeah. guys and Oof. ladies. They, that's whatever to USC. But shade uh, USC, shade University of Spoiled Children. Yeah. Um, the first, it, my first year directing class, first semester, first year directing class. My professor, I won't say his name, was so against shots where you would see characters backs to the camera he was uh-huh. he hated it and was like almost like it was taboo like you should never wow. do it and i was vehemently against that idea i thought it was ridiculous and i i'd never understood his rationalization and in some ways and this is why i won't say his name i thought that it was like kind of like limiting as a director like you just don't have the scope or creativity or understanding Mm -hmm. that that's not how human beings always perceive the world or that's not how human beings always behave when they interact with one another so for the great kurosawa to have his opening shot with his two of his protagonists have their back to the camera was striking to me and i agree with you just in terms of the you know immediately what you're up against and what you're going to be dealing with the the framing of it felt perfect, but it also threw me off because as somebody this that was watching this for the first time, I didn't expect to see the two of them before mm-hmm. I saw uh, Mufune. I thought we were going right. to see our hero right away, and we didn't. Um, so I thought that that was really interesting, and that that threw me for a loop. And I was like, okay, this is definitely going to be something different than what I expected coming into this, um, and also. The fact that it's such a very long take, and that such we're, a long take, yeah. And then when it cut to the side, it almost felt jarring because I was so invested mm-hmm. in that one shot that was unfolding in this one take, that mm-hmm. or this one setup, um, that I rather you know th- those are the kind of things that I like as a filmmaker. I like long takes. I like staying in a particular setup to just let the actors act and let mm-hmm. them perform and just kind of give them a box to play within and then let them play. So all of that happened in that first shot, and I, I thought it was amazing. I agree with you, Liam. I also think that the idea of saying you can't begin a movie that way with the historical knowledge that, I mean, I, maybe this particular professor had not seen this film, but you could argue that this is one of, if not probably top 10 most influential movies ever made on the history of where, like, May, at least mainstream filmmaking made. I mean, like, like you know, there's an interview on the Criterion channel connected to this film with George Lucas right. talking about how John Milius introduced him to Kurosawa and he was, like, kind of into it. And then when he was planning Star Wars, he was like, oh, I should revisit Hidden Fortress because I really like the idea of the main of, of introducing the story not through the princess and the warrior, but through the the lowly the low, lowest characters on the totem pole right and so the idea of of them introducing the film with them running away i think is just like the perfect choice to, to for us to understand exactly who these people are and i also think just the other thing that's really interesting to me is that kurosawa was not known for long takes until this period in his career and i think part of it was because of the cinema scope so not only is he like 
making an incredibly influential movie, but he's, I think he's helping to rewrite cinematography with the way he chooses to frame movies in, Mm -hmm. in this film and the films that go, that go forward. I would, I would need to go back though too, but I mean, I feel like he has in the past also done that too, right? Where there's like a lot of shots Mm -hmm. from the perspective of like a character's back or that you're seeing, let's say two characters and you're seeing one obviously like facing the camera or towards us. Mm-hmm. And the other characters, you can't see their face. I mean, I, 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 I I'm honestly drawing a blank. The here. stray dog. I think he he likes to work in triangles, yeah. but you know, to to get really film nerdy, the frames Please. in those movies are all they're not cinemascope, so they're much right. more narrow, right? Yeah, and so you can't give the expanse of frame. And I'd love to hear Randy, if, you know, your thoughts versus the way he maybe composed in earlier films. It's all very narrow. It's all very close together. And it works for these films that even Seven Samurai or some of the more domestic films or the city films where people are all on top of each other in Tokyo in 1948, yeah. right? But all of a sudden he has this like vista and he's shooting in Hyogo, which is a beautiful place in Japan from what I under- I mean, well, just from seeing the movie, it's a beautiful place. And so suddenly it feels like the options and the way he can frame things are so much more nuanced than they would have been in it, not in this format the, the scope of the film really hit me in that scene where they all kind of all the prisoners revolt yeah and they're coming down the stairs jaw dropping yeah and it was like holy shit and that goes to what randy was saying too about the use of extras and the size of it that was the first moment where i was like my god like this film is like a massive adventure you got we dug in immediately to the nerdy stuff do you guys like this movie i love th- i think this movie <laughs> rules it's so good yeah i mean I, I loved it i thought it was great it's not again it goes back to not what i thought it was going to be I, mm-hmm. I anticipated more action and there's really not that much action in this film for some for something that is rooted in um you know like empire versus empire Mm-hmm. Clan versus clan, uh, princess on the run with like great general guy on the run with the princess and gold. I thought that there were there were going to be more like quote unquote action moments, and a mm-hmm. lot of it seems to just be rooted in character and setting us up for certain moments and um, this like long character process mm-hmm. and. Um, rooting it in the two lower characters on the totem pole, but really having them push the story for us and like create the danger. Like it was almost as if they were creating the danger and not the action moments, which again was something that I found really interesting because it was a different take on this type of film. Mm -hmm. Um, So I found that interesting. Um, And going back to the idea of, you know, CinemaScope and how that impacted how we viewed it and and his filmmaking, I think that was more appropriate for this story because it's mm-hmm. the, because there isn't as much action, there isn't as much like kinetic energy from scene to scene. It didn't need to be narrow. It needed to be more expansive and it needed to like tell the story of like the geography because mm-hmm. again, this was about clan versus clan and empire versus empire and geography clearly plays a role in it because they're trying to get across the border. Like the whole plan mm-hmm. is to get from one part of the region to another part. And I think that he really used the landscape well in terms of revealing when and creating danger and like conflict because the guys would like walk up a, let's say they walked up this hill and right over the hill, you would see the police or whatever they were. Mm-hmm. You would see mm-hmm. like the army on the other side or they were going down the mountain or the hill and then the army just appeared right over the ridge and like all of a sudden Mm -hmm. they were and he did it constantly and it was just really smart masterful use of the geography i felt like and he couldn't have been Mm -hmm. able to do that if he wasn't in cinemascope like he it just you just wouldn't feel that danger or that reveal um if the format was different uh in my opinion because it just it just would have you wouldn't have feel you wouldn't have felt as much of the the geography and the area um, if he didn't have that format available to him. So I think mm-hmm. that he he leveraged it specifically for this story in like a really smart and masterful way. You know, it's one of the things that is interesting 
and powerful about this movie is when there's a moment in the film where they're going uphill and they get to the top of the hill and these all these soldiers start coming up and the camera pulls back as they and it it's a great example of like literally a moment when you go <gasps> yeah like you can't you can't believe it's it's happening and it's you know because of the wideness of the frame everything is in focus and he finds ways to to make you feel to challenge your perception of space and challenge where things are in relationship to one another. That is like really exciting. I feel like you can see the influence in so many movies that came, you know, it's the star Wars is the obvious reference, but like I was thinking a lot about, I weirdly thought about, and for other reasons, but I thought a little bit about some of these like Westerns that came after it. I thought a lot about um, Quentin Tarantino's Westerns and his war films a little bit, like just the, the decision to shoot and scope and what that means in terms of like what you make space for in the narrative. And and it, the narrative in this is a little more stretched out. There's almost, um, and I want to come back to this, but there's almost a video game quality to the, the story in this. It's like, like you said, we have to get from one point to another and the, the objective is really clear. And what's interesting about the movie is where it goes along the way. Yeah. It's like red dead redemption. <laughs> yeah. Or the Mandalorian. <laughs> Was one thing yeah. that I thought of. Well, Which is very, like, feels like watching a video game, yeah. yeah. George, what'd you think? Oh, my God, I, I love this film. And I would, like, at some point also, I was like, man, I think this is... I mean, at the moment that I was watching it, I thought, oh, this is my favorite Kurosawa. But then afterwards, I was like, no, it's not my favorite. But it's definitely <laughs> top... Right now, it's top five. And I would say I would put Throne of Blood... And I obviously, these kind of hierarchies are limiting, but... Um, I also just realized that with this one, I was like, wow, I guess it's like, it's the samurai films that are really, to me, the most compelling ones. And I don't know if it's because it's kind of, there's a certain kind of sense of like escapism and going into that kind of like historical world that's like very, very different from kind of what you typically see on film or what Mm -hmm. I typically see on film. But yeah, I just love the scope of it. I love the adventure of it. I couldn't, again, help but constantly be thinking about Star Wars but also, like you said, Liam, yeah, how influential it is to Westerns mm-hmm. and to so many kind of other films. But I just fucking love this film. It was one of the films, too, that I just had fun from beginning to end watching. And also, like, there were a lot of, there was a lot of humor, too. Mm-hmm. Like, that one scene, which I texted you about, when they get um, captured and then they're being brought to the village or whatever, the castle, whatever it is. And I believe it's Ty. He says something like, oh, man, like, are we going to have to bury corpses again? <laughs> like that, that line is just h- hilarious. Like you even see how like Lucas stole a lot of the humor from from this film as well. Like a lot of the sight gags, too. Yeah. Like later on, like when, like when Mufuni is chasing those guys on the horse, which is an incredible scene. And then he like turns the corner and he runs into the like their their base like that's st- like you see that in star wars as well like when han solo is running through the death star and he like turns the corner and like there's all those stormtroopers it's one of the great like, greatest moments in in that movie by like right. yeah like those, si- those si- he stole those psych acts from yeah, yeah think, um, well. i'm sorry i Go think ahead, um no. i think i like the, the filmmaking more than the story to be quite honest mm-hmm. i think i like kurosawa and the performances and the cinematography more than i actually like the writing I mean, I thought it was funny and um, I was into it, but I think I was more into the craftsmanship of it rather than the actual story. I don't feel like I was totally engaged with the story itself. Um, so it wouldn't, I wouldn't put it like as one of my favorite Kurosawa films. Um, but I think that it's like a master class in filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Uh, you know, to me, the thing that, keeps uh, that I kept thinking while watching this and I felt this with almost every movie but I was like god damn if if only we could have seen this thing in a theater for the first time because yeah, I've yeah, never yeah. seen it on the big screen I've I'd seen it once before this and certainly not in the context of having watched 12 Kurosawa movies before this and I really love it too it's like a it's like a collective there's a breath of fresh air in this movie for me like especially having watched like the lower depths which is very intense and then the other films and it felt like there was it's interesting that you talk about the craft ranty because i think on some level the thing that is most amazing about this movie is how effortless yeah. he makes all everything feel like you don't feel the strain or or whatever you never feel like you're in less than the hands of one of the one of the most talented guys to ever put a camera on something and, and create a visual story right and he manages to make the story, which I think if you pause and watch might feel a little ridiculous. He manages to make it work on this like grand 
spectacle level. But at the same time, I think the strongest thing about it, and I'd love to chat about your, you guys, how it related to Star Wars for you, because that's really interesting to me, is that I felt like he still manages to like center the characters. Yeah, it's total um, confidence in your choices. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, we talked about it already, but that opening shot, just demonstrates confidence in your your choices as a director to say this is where we're going to put the camera and this is what's going to happen in this shot you know what i mean and I, I feel like with every shot that he that he chose he was confident in that choice and said no this is this is the way to tell this story in this way you know in the way that i see it and i feel like you can tell that with a you can tell when a director is feeling that and when a director is not feeling that if you're like aware of the craft mm. and i think that making those choices repeatedly and being consistent with it and establishing that confidence in the language mm-hmm. for this particular story is where you get that feeling liam and i think that when people directors start they're not totally sure with their choices or whatever the factors may be and that that language and that craftsmanship is inconsistent from scene to scene sequence to sequence you know moment to moment that's when you feel like you know that you're not along for the ride you know what i mean Mm -hmm. mean, there's a lot of films where you have these moments which are great but the entire film doesn't work and a lot of times i think it comes down to besides writing and you know like other things of course I, i think a lot of it comes down to a director just being confident in the choices that he or she is making and and riding through all the way. And sometimes they deviate from it because they might not be, it, you know, it might be a situation where like the professor from NYU says, don't do this instead of you just saying, nah, this is what I'm going to do because this is what's mm-hmm. best for the story. Mm-hmm. I think we should also point out that not all professors are bad people. No, all saying. professors no, are bad no, people. I'm just, just, no, just saying. I, 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 as somebody who doesn't have like any, you know, I'm just saying. No, nothing. Guillotine the professors. <laughs> guillotine them. I've, uh, I've, I've taught film classes before, so yeah, no, it's just. Uh, <laughs> I know. I'm just, yeah. just teasing. Um, but I, I, but speaking of like, I think like George is so oh, like, angry. He's just shooting daggers. <laughs> him. He's furious. like, he's texting us. Probably gonna kill think, you guys yeah. when this is I, over. <laughs> I think a, le- a lesser like filmmaker too would have made like for example maybe shown and obviously there's like budgetary concerns as well, um, but like it's amazing that the film starts with them like complaining that they were late to the battle. Yeah. Right. Like it doesn't begin with like any sort of kind of it doesn't begin with a huge action sequence. It begins with this kind of like intimate moment. Again, obviously from point of view where you don't even see their faces, it's just long shot, long take. Where I think like a lesser filmmaker would have just kind of like already would have shown you something there like to get you like hooked. And he's like going back to like this confidence in his choices, right? Being like, no, let's like begin like at the end of the sequence right? where these guys and it says it totally fits into their characters, right? And who they are and what happens later in the film that you see them leaving after like, well, we fucked that up too. Like, right. didn't we? It's like such a good decision. I think that one thing that is interesting to think about is that like for, I mean, I know having knowing you guys, star Wars is so influential on our psyches and our like love for visual storytelling. And like, it's, you know, it's, it is now, you know, for when we were younger dudes, I think it was like, Oh, star Wars was something we thought about every couple of years. And now it's like such in the consciousness of culture all the time for better or for worse. In some ways, I think honestly for worse, but for whatever worse. for we, <laughs> thank you, Randy. Exactly. But, um, Oh man, I'm not going to get my trilogy for Lucasfilm now. I really screwed that <laughs> <I know>. up. But <laughs> but I think part of the reason, and I wonder what you guys think, part of the reason that we expected a grander, more expansive epic is because we're expecting um, a sequence like the end uh, of the original Star Wars when they blow up the Death Star. Like my assumption in the whole yeah. movie is that the Hidden Fortress was the Death Star. Yeah. Hmm. But then you do have well, that moment 10 or 15 minutes in that is jaw dropping on the stairs where there's folks coming down the stairs and you know they're they're moving up the stairs and it, it feels like you know Kuros- kurosawa very no- a huge cinema fan huge silent cinema fan i thought a lot about all that um eisenstein stuff from battleship potemkin in that moment but it feels to me like this movie plays more interesting be- in ways that and how it does not relate to Star Wars than in how it does relate to Star Wars. Yes, that's okay. I'm glad you said that because I was going to bring that up. I 
after watching it, I don't really see the the huge connections to Star Wars, to be quite honest. Like I think that mm-hmm. there are moments and I I totally get uh why people say that. Um obviously like the two bumbling idiots are some version of uh C three PO and R T D D two. Um it's the um Han Solo and the princess. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I get those dynamics. I know like the um, having the the doubles like in the prequels with uh, Padme. Yes. I get that. Um, I I get the thing with the horse. Um, you know, like cha- with uh, <laughs> Infume on the uh, yeah, on the yeah. horse. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> and I I I largely get it, but I I think it's only in outside of um. The, the treatment of the two characters and like centering the story around the two characters throughout the entire Star Wars universe. I'm not, I think that there are other films that you can like immediately point to and say, this mm-hmm. is this, at least visually or like um, costume wise, those things I can immediately say that influenced Star Wars more than Hidden Fortress now that I've seen it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, like, where you guys see like the major connections. Cause I see them, but then I, I, I didn't, I expected more mm-hmm. than what mm-hmm. it actually was or is in my mind. I mean, I was, I was surprised at how much of star Wars I felt like there was in this oh, with all wow. the things you just said too. Right. With like, yeah, the, the two guys as being kind of like versions of the droids, obviously, which I knew that like, that was the most obvious thing. And like, I knew also about like, the princess but i also think like what this film what this film does really well that i think the first couple of star wars films did really well was that they were both epic but also very intimate and Mm -hmm. i don't know if that intimacy comes through because of how well drawn these characters are but by that i mean that you get the sense that there's these much larger political historical kind of intrigues that are happening like that one moment for example where he just draws the map in the sand and it basically says, like, I we're here. Yeah. We need to get there. And it reminded me of, like, the Seven Samurai, which does the same thing really well. But the way in which, like, with really quick brushstrokes, like Kurosawa draws these larger historical tableaus, but also makes them feel really intimate. And I think, again, like, the, the first Star Wars films, like, did that really well. In the sense, like, there are all of these stories and there's this huge universe that's happening. But all you really need to focus on are these characters who are like are doing their thing like in the small corner of the universe. But what's the okay, so what's the big universe in Hidden Fortress? Oh, well, like like you get all like all of this kind of like intri- like for example, like this on um, perhaps ongoing war between these two clans that we don't really know about, but all we're getting is like funneled through the um the perspectives of these two characters. Um, you get like this background between like these two generals that are clearly like they were friends, but now mm-hmm. they're enemies, but they both have like this big, like they both have like this um, enduring respect for one another. There's also this other place that they have to get to this other kingdom in which they are, they're allies with them, but you don't obviously know like why they're allies or what the perspective is. I mean, I think it does like a really good job. Also, there's a princess, but you don't know who her parents are. You don't know exactly what kind of claim she has to the, the throne. I mean, it, it, to me, it, it drew like all of these questions and made me like think about like all of these other things that were happening. But you didn't really need to know about them. Yeah, I'm just you were just kind of drawn into the story. I'm just not sure. I I felt like the larger world mm-hmm. of the the dueling um, clans and kingdoms. Like I just mm-hmm. I think I I know enough to make sure that it works for the story. Like I know that they're at odds, but I didn't feel the like overarching danger and consequence of what would happen with these two kingdoms. You know, like Mm -hmm. I know when I watch star Wars, it's clearly like the rebels versus this empire. And like the empire Mm -hmm. is, is present. Like the empire is, is driven by this like villain. And I know who the villain is and I know what's driving the villain, which is like the force and the emperor, there's like layers to like that kingdom. And I know that like the rebellion has this hierarchy and this is what they're fighting against. Mm -hmm. For this one, it felt more like we're on the ground with the rebellion and like very much in their intimate story and like, how are they going to get there? But I didn't feel like the grander, larger world of consequence between these like two dueling places, because really 
it wasn't about the um I'm totally gonna like mess their pronunciation up, but it wasn't about um the princess's clan. Like we never mm-hmm. got the the pers- their perspective of the clan because they were essentially wiped out. Yeah. So it's like wh- it's what are the t- they're not really like two dueling kingdoms. It's just the remnants of one kingdom trying to get back to the throne versus, you know, against like these guys that are at the border. You know what I mean? And it's like, I, I wasn't really even sure like who was in, who was the main leader of mm-hmm. uh, the, what was it? The Yama, Yamayana? Ake, Ake, uh, it's Akizaki is, no, is no, the, that's the princess. Yeah. But yeah, for oh, the yeah, other yeah, king, yeah. the dueling yeah. kingdom, um, I don't the even Yamana know who the Pan, leader right? was. Like who was like the main? There were so many different like. It, it felt like there were like tribal chiefs almost. In a well, way, that's because you don't see the emperor hologram until the sequel, right? right? And I don't, <laughs> but I don't see a Darth Vader either. Like so, who's? Yeah. I so this is interesting. I I think Darth Vader. There's only one moment that I was like, oh, Darth Vader, and it's the moment where Hyoe Tadakoro shows up at the end with the scar on his face. Yeah, and mm-hmm. his face is disfigured, and there's that beautiful moment. Which I think is kind of the core. If the movie has anything substantive to say, it's sort of uh, the princess Yuki, sort of like being down among the people and realizing she has like a larger responsibility than just being yeah. a queen. But that's the only moment where I felt like I was watching, I was seeing like a bit of a Darth Vader. Here's the, I wonder if some of this is marketing. And what I mean when I say that is like Lucas makes. Hidden Fortress, right? I mean, sorry, he, <laughs> he makes Star Wars, right? <laughs> slip, yeah. He makes Star Wars, and it, a cottage industry is built up around it, and everyone wants to talk to George Lucas about this incredible thing that he's made, and he, you know, because he's a nerd, a film nerd, is like, well, uh, I love Akira Kurosawa's The Hidden Fortress, and that is, become sort of the legend. Not that it wasn't influenced by that, because he clearly states that it was, but I watched an interview with him today where he's like, yeah, the Hidden Fortress is like my fifth favorite Kurosawa movie. Like he, like he's kind of like he's a little bit dismissive of the movie itself, but but he knows what to plagiarize. He wow. plagiarizes the right. He kind of he kind of steals well, I mean, the right yeah, elements. I mean, right, you know? yeah, yeah, and Sub- he also at one sublime p- poets steal. And right? then one Mediocre point, poets borrow, sublime poets steal. Oh my god, these fucking professors. Am I right? My god. <laughs> but at one point in the interview, he's like, you know, my movie kind of borrows, borrows, liberates the the sort of lower characters as the main sort of narrators. We're seeing the story from their point of view. But then he makes a comment. He's like, but you know, in Star Wars, the princess is a lot more of a stand and fight character. And mm. I was like, but I think Yuki's kind of a badass. Like I saw, so one of the, she is. I thought Princess Leo mm. is clearly like, cl- maybe he doesn't realize this, like clearly influenced by Yuki in this movie. Cause she's like talks, she talks back to everyone. She doesn't like take Mifune. She doesn't take this sort of patriarchal way. He tells her like, you have to do this. She's like, no, shut up. Like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Like, stop trying to bait me, dude. Like, it's right. it's interesting in that way. I, I wonder if it's just one of those things that's become commonplace in how we think about it. Like, clearly it had an influence, but it's become more of a of a thing that it, maybe it was. Because I'm with you, Randy. Also, it feels much more on the ground and much more visceral and intimate yeah. as a film than Star Wars does. But also that first Star Wars is like, a. I mean, the other thing also is obviously like, it's a great film in of itself, it obviously does. It reinvents what it borrows. Like, like I don't know. Like the the I think the looking for like complete one to one correspondences kind of like kind of misses the point, right? Like clearly, it's just like this film influenced Star Wars. Right. It doesn't mean that it's a complete like shot for shot or like completely borrows everything directly from it. I think also like there's like another kind of like interesting analog between like the samurai who like within the Western like let's say cinematic canon becomes like the cowboy or like for lucas becomes like the jedi it doesn't mean that obviously like the jedi isn't like an invention or isn't something new that lucas also like invented i'm just saying like there's like analogs it's also really interesting because like so much of like the mandalorian for example like is still like ripping off um japanese cinema and kurosawa in particular yeah but i was also thinking about like the lone wolf and cub series um Real quick, and then I think I want to talk about Mifune and the corollary with Star Wars, but this film is called a Jida Geki film, which is a genre of film and television from Japan that translates as period dramas, and they all take place in a specific moment in Japanese history, and they're also known as Shambara movies, which Shambara means sword fight. 
So there's kind of a, a genre that this is based upon, right? So it's like, it's interesting to think about this influenced Star Wars, but clearly this this kind of Gita Geki films were so prevalent in the era when this film was made and such a part of pop culture. So it's like, you can continue to draw backwards and backwards and backwards with these films in terms of what their influences are. And really it's like, I feel like, this is just probably the high considered the high art version of a, of a Gita Geke film. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, totally. Um, let's talk about Mifune. So in the notes, our friend George Fregopoulos wrote Mifune's legs and his <laughs> Hans. I mean, there he's fit and his Han Solo meets Luke Skywalker performance. Um, did you guys get Han Solo vibes from this guy? curious I, I i got more han solo than luke skywalker yeah yeah for sure i didn't get either one i feel like it's a totally <laughs> I mean, different it's I interesting right if i had to choose i would say han solo but again it goes back to how i feel like this that the the connection between this film and star wars isn't as strong as i thought it was going to be i mean i don't yeah i, I agree. really don't i don't see either one either i see moments but i don't and again it doesn't have to be like a one-on-one thing like a one-to-one mm-hmm. thing but i mean the people say that this is like the one of the foundational films for star wars and i, I just don't see that like i i, I right. see borrowing but i don't see how this is like a foundational piece and with the um mufune character i don't i don't see han or luke and anyway i don't either and i think that what's what's interesting is i think this is an interesting way to talk about one of the things that i think is thematically interesting about the movie which is the way it sort of plays the peasants against the royalty yeah like there's an interesting kind of i don't know what this movie has to say about class if if anything i mean it is kind of an adventure but there's these little smart interesting things snuck into it like the fact that we're watching the film from the peasants point of view how did what did you guys think of the decision to root randy you talked about this a little bit but the decision to tell the story from the peasants perspective as opposed to from the princess and the warriors okay so i'm going to take this a little left because i when this was happening i thought immediately of parasite and oh. um I am not the biggest fan of Parasite. I'll just say that. You and, get off this spot. No, I'm just kidding. I know. <laughs> and and part of the reason is because I think that the discussions of class are like really muddled and it gets too much credit just because it's actually mm. taken the risk of speaking about class. Mm. Um, and I th- so I think the film gets too much credit. I don't really think it's saying as much as we would like to think it is, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And I think that this does a better job I was speaking about class than something like Parasite because I think that it allows the dynamics to play out more. And I think that um, the peasants are constant. You're, it is very clear what their motivation is. And it is very clear that they are going to make certain choices based off this one motivation. Like even when their survival is at stake, they are always thinking about gold. And... <laughs> that they're always thinking about their economic position throughout the entire film and they're risk they're they're willing to risk their lives mm-hmm. they're willing to turn their back they're willing to turn their back against each other and i think there are multiple scenes not just with <clears throat> the two peasants but with other secondary characters in the film where it is very clear what the class dynamics are and what people will do to like get out of that situation. Like even the yeah. scene at the beginning when they're all just like the extras are like laying out and then they attack the soldiers. Like that told me a lot about how desperate they were to get out mm-hmm. of their situation, mm-hmm. to get out of slavery essentially. Um the young woman that the princess uh saves when they're in that village, her loyalty to like the queen or the princess or whatever is like very apparent. She's willing to like sacrifice her life mm-hmm. for her, which is in very stark, stark contrast to the two male peasants. You know, like there's like class seems very, very like clear to me in this film. And I, and I think the perspective and the honesty that like not everybody's going to act the same way, even though they're in the same situation was very, um, mm-hmm. was very accurate and I appreciated it because even in the scene when they're running down the steps, our two like peasants are off to the side. They use it as an opportunity to be, to like get the, to escape. 
you know, is it like there's so many layers? Yeah, yeah, there's so many layers to it that I think like really accurately um, present Kurosawa's perspective on class at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think the for me where where like I was watching the film and I was like, oh, this is like a fun adventure movie. Like I'm really (laughs) enjoying it. Like it's a pure piece of entertainment. But where it turns is that is that moment when she literally buys back the woman who has been sold into like sexual slavery. Like that's the part of the film for me was like, oh, okay, like class really where it made the class dynamics became way um, became foregrounded in a way that they weren't before. But yeah, you're totally right. Like it's it's very much about um, the class tensions uh, between what the peasants represent and obviously what the royalty represents. And I think to the movie's credit, it, it, every character feels fully realized around those dynamics in the yep. sense that like, you know, traditionally when we see a character like Mufune, he's heroic and noble and has nobility mm-hmm. and all these things. But also he's a little bit like, yeah, but also let's lie to these guys about what we're doing. Let's pretend we're one right. thing. Um, and then at the end, and so they don't, they're sort of at a disadvantage throughout the film and by the end of it, we're kind of like we at the end when they find out what's really going on. They're given this like little pitiance, and then there's the moment where yeah. it's like, and she says, "Share it, you, right? You can, yeah, right. you guys have to share it. You have to. This right. is what you have to do. That's the noble thing to do." And then one of the en- ones like to like, "You can keep it. It's fine. I don't care." Like it, 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 so it, you, it gives us make real that, people. Though? The fact that they is that. Oh. Is that like a moment of like solidarity that they've in fact like learned to become like friends? Well, they are friends through the whole film. They clearly care about each other, right? I don't think. I think that they're sort of well, posturing about like like oh we're done. I I is like very rooted in in a kind of like sticky clown technique kind of thing. It's like that, how we act on this podcast. Exactly. Like every time we record yeah, an episode, we're like I am done, done with, with you. this Fuck stupid you. fucking. <laughs> fun. We truly are the two low the peasant clowns of, of the podcasting <laughs> we truly community. Are bubbling idiots. But yeah, I, I don't know what I, I think at the end. I, it it feels just like a fun little flourish. But I think in the context of what we're talking about, there's more to it. What do you think, George? I mean, I was pissed that they didn't give the Wookiee any gold. <laughs> He's just standing there. I'm like, come on. He <laughs> give the fucking Wookiee something. Um, no, I just, uh, yeah, I thought it was, I thought, again, it was like a moment of like solidarity whereby like they finally, in some to some degree, come to some kind of like, I don't know, a conclusion about their friendship. And again, right before, or a few minutes before that, right, they say something like, oh, I hope we're, I hope we're friends till the end or if we die, we'll see each other in heaven. <laughs> Like I, I actually think their friendship becomes way more established, um, or way more sincere at the very end. Yeah, I agree. And I think all you have to do is look at the two shots. I mean, we we talked about the opening mm-hmm. shot. You can yeah. just look at the ending shot. You know, it's it's basically um, always get these terms wrong, but it's basically the flip side of the the mirror the, um, image or something. Yeah, it's the mirror image of the the opening mm-hmm. shot, mm-hmm, like. Mm-hmm. You know, in the opening shot, their back is to us and they're socially distant, you know, to use the term of the uh, current times. <laughs> it's good that they stayed six feet apart yeah, for the yeah, entire filming process. And then uh, <laughs> at the end, uh, they're not six feet apart and they're walking towards us. Right. Um, and they're smiling. At, in yeah. the opening shot, they're weathered, they're like scared, they're flustered. And at the end, they're they're not like that. They're satisfied. They're happy. They've reached some kind of, um, um, you know, the understanding of one another. They've gone through this long journey. You know, the mm-hmm. the the two shots tell you like where the relationship was and is um, as we go through the journey. So, um, I think that that was really interesting, and maybe maybe the the idea was that the the thing that they thought was really important to him wasn't, which is the gold, because that's what mm-hmm. they wanted the entire time. And really it was the two of them that was, you know, the most important thing. That was, you know, to be corny, that was the treasure at the end of the journey. Um Aww. discovering their friendship. You <laughs> know. Yeah. So well, <laughs> I'm happy and satisfied with the journey that we've taken talking about <laughs> and the what a hidden journey. fortress. What a journey. Um Randy Thanks for joining us for this. It was great to have you, you on yeah. and um, yeah, thank dig you for into this me. thing. Do you? Um, we'll, we're going to invite you back next season for we'll 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 figure out for Warren Beatty. So start thinking about Ooh. your favorite Warren Beatty movie, Dick Tracy. You, you're in, dude. Ah. It's yours. You got it. <laughs> um, what what would you like to tell? What are you working on? What's where should we? Where can we find your work and the stuff that you're doing? 
Uh, you can find my work at pamsun.com. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to been to be working through this uh, horrible time. A um, little scary to work during this horrible time, mm-hmm. but i um, been fortunate enough to work. I can't say everything yet because they won't let me. Um, but uh, You're doing a Star Wars movie? <laughs> I wish. I wish. So, dude, how about trilogy? that? Check, 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 um, check. Uh, I am doing something pretty big. It's like the biggest thing in my career where they need to like finish the deal. It's like the people above my pay grade are like still figuring stuff out. So hopefully I'll mm-hmm. be able to, uh, announce that soon. But, um, my first, uh, big brand commercial is coming out, uh, on Friday. So, nice. um, December 11th. So, I'm, you know, I don't know when this is going to drop, but December 11th, it'll, uh, it'll come out. So I'm really excited about that. And, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just happy to be working and making stuff and, and being an artist, so that's pretty cool. Um, Will you be able to send us a link? Kind to of that in- commercial? incredibly, this movie was finished on December eleventh, nineteen fifty-eight, and your commercial it's a, is it's coming a full out. Full circle. That's yeah. nuts, it's, man. It's, like, it's you, like Hidden Fortress. It's like Hidden can Fortress. You, can you delay the release to December twenty eighth so that it like really lines up? Just call and be like, I was just on a podcast you've never heard of, and they I, said only if uh, yeah. only if I get to edit it myself this time. Yeah, this multi-million dollar project that you've been working on. Can you please deliver? Yeah. I know the <laughs> clown peasants podcast. of the podcasting community. <laughs> and they. <laughs> um, next up on the show, we're going to talk to Ingu Kang about the bad sleep well. Kurosawa's Ooh. adaptation of Hamlet. And then there'll be more. And it's going to be great. And... Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think is Hamlet the name of a Star Wars film that I haven't yeah, seen. Yeah, Hamlet is the the, the <laughs> new the new Star Wars film. Um, please, if you get a chance, rate, review, and subscribe to the show if you haven't done already. Just review the show, you guys. Just give us Come a review. On. Come on, please. please. We need the reviews. Um, Randy, it was great to have you. Thanks again. Thanks, Randy. Yeah, thank you. It's awesome. I was Liam Billingham. I was George Fergopoulos. I was Randy Wilkins. And this was oovra busters what a smooth are you kidding me we gotta get this guy to do do that twice yeah and me